Well, it has finally happened. We are beginning our study on Daniel. I'm going, to probably, I'm going to probably go a little long today, so appreciate you bearing with me, but I want to do a good introduction to the book and then work through all of chapter one. Um, the Wednesday night group is taking bets on how long this is going to go. Uh, I don't know what the over-under is, but uh, talk to Craig if you want to get in on that action. But we're going to be here, I would say, at least 12 weeks, probably, probably a little bit more. So, all right, starting out, just kind of setting the stage for all this, we need to frame out when this book was written and what it covers, and that's going to help us understand a lot of the things that are going on there. And, of course, we could start any larger timeline with the act of creation, From that time early on, God just kind of dealt with everyone equally, and that didn't work out so good. So God went to a man named Abraham in 2080 BC, this is Genesis 12, and he tells him, through your offspring, I'm going to make them a great nation, I'm going to give them a promised land, and I'm going to bless the other nations through them. And God starts to do that. And then we have the Exodus take place in 1446 BC. And this is a pivotal moment for a number of reasons. So after God had made this promise to Abraham, he and his wife had a child finally. And um, indeed, the numbers increased greatly. But for a long time, they were just a people group. They were an ethnic group of people. They were descendants of Abraham. But when they engaged in the Exodus, God raised up a man named Moses to lead them. And when they marched out of Egypt under Moses, they went from being a people group to being a nation. They were a nation, though, without a king. Until 1051 BC, when King Saul united all the tribes into one kingdom. And he didn't do a great job as king, but that's a story for another day. A couple of kings later, we have Solomon, and the kingdom really reached its peak under him. 960 BC, King Solomon builds the first temple, and it is absolutely magnificent. Solomon's son, not quite the king that he was, causes all sorts of trouble when he succeeds Solomon, and actually the kingdom winds up splitting in 931 BC, and you wind up with the northern kingdom, which is Israel, and the southern kingdom, which is Judah. And in 722 BC-ish, the northern kingdom falls to the Assyrians. So the northern kingdom gets taken out, and they are no more. Nineveh then falls summer of 612 BC. And if you remember, we were talking a lot about Nineveh. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. We were talking about that a lot over the summer. And effectively, that ends the Assyrian Empire. They hang on for a little while. Uh, Pharaoh Necho II kind of helped him out a little bit, but then Nebuchadnezzar comes along and he finishes the job and the Assyrian Empire is done, done by 605 BC. Nebuchadnezzar also attacks Jerusalem, the head of uh, Judea, the the capital of Judea. And then it gets kind of confusing because we know that Judea falls. But if you try to nail down the time, it starts to get really difficult to triangulate because Judea actually falls three different times. It's really a three-phase sort of thing. But it falls for the first time probably 607 B.C. And King Jehoiakim was the king in Judah at the time. Nebuchadnezzar takes over. He leaves Jehoiakim in charge but kind of forces him into submission. And then Nebuchadnezzar leaves We just lost our video. Nebuchadnezzar uh, leaves, and then uh, Jehoiakim uh, rebels. He gets support from Egypt. And then 597 BC, Nebuchadnezzar uh, winds up attacking Jerusalem again. And he takes everybody into captivity this time, including the royal family. He appoints a man named Zedekiah to rule over what's left of Jerusalem. And then he rebels too. Nebuchadnezzar comes back again, 587 and into 586 BC, and he defeats Jerusalem a third time. Um, He takes Zedekiah, he kills his sons in front of him and pokes out his eyes. So the last thing he ever sees is the brutal murder of his children. Uh, And then um, Nebuchadnezzar goes on a tear. He knocks down everything in Jerusalem, including destroying Solomon's temple. And then finally on our timeline, 
the Babylonian Empire falls in 539 BC to a Persian named Cyrus. And shortly thereafter, King Cyrus uh, let Israel go back and rebuilds Jerusalem. And so, oh good, we do have some of that back. All right, and so what we wind up with here is sort of this timeline that sets the stage for our Daniel story. And if you remember a few months back, we worked through the book uh, of Nahum. And I don't, I'm sorry, we got some, let me restart this, I apologize. We got some problem, the slides are not showing up as. Oh, that's better. All right, so there we go. Now we're caught up here. All right, so we worked through the book of Nahum over the summer. And if you remember when we were talking about that, Nahum gets written sometime right around in there. This is between 636 and 654 BC. Remember, the northern kingdom, that's Israel, falls to the Assyrians, right? And the Assyrians did their work by just going around and butchering everybody. And so they take out the northern kingdom. They start taking out the other kingdoms that are around. They're the, they're the world power at the time. And then they start attacking the southern kingdom of Judah. And so God sent this message through the prophet Nahum that Assyria, Nineveh, would be destroyed. And as we said, that prophecy comes true in 612 BC. It's on our timeline. And then the Assyrian empire falls. And it's replaced... The Assyrian Empire is replaced by the, uh, as the dominant power by the Babylonian Empire. And when Jerusalem falls the first time uh, to the Babylonians, a number of youths are carried away, including our friend Daniel. And that's the beginning of the book of Daniel. And the book, uh, the book of Daniel covers this whole block of time uh, at the bottom here. Daniel served Nebuchadnezzar, who toppled Jerusalem all three times, and he would also serve King Cyrus, who would eventually send the people back uh, to rebuild. If we think about the book itself, the way this is structured, the book of Daniel, there's 12 chapters, and it's really two groups of six. The first six chapters each contain a story. There's one story per chapter. In those first six chapters, all of the writing is in third person. And interestingly, it's partly in Aramaic. It starts out in Hebrew, and then in chapter 2, verse 4, the second part of that, it switches to Aramaic. And then in chapter 8, it switches back to Hebrew again. Same thing happens in the book of Ezra. Uh, there's a lot of speculation as to why these books are in two different languages, but the truth of the matter is we don't really know. But it's interesting because in the book of Daniel, as we work through this, we see there's these conflict between these two cultures. We have Judaism and then we have these other nations. And it's almost like the tension between these two cultures gets highlighted with the language starting with the Jewish language and then shifting to the language of the Babylonians and then back to the language of the Jews again. I don't know uh, if that's why God did that, but there is a certain poetry to that. So again, the first six chapters uh, of Daniel, we've got these six stories. And the first one we'll work through this morning. We see, we're going to see these four Israelite young men who refuse to eat food from the king's table. And we see what happens with that. Chapter two, Daniel interprets a dream of Nebuchadnezzar. None of his wise men can do that, but Daniel is able to do that because God empowered him to do that. Chapter 3, that's the story of the fiery furnace, and Daniel's friends refuse to bow to an idol, and uh, this story takes place because of that. In chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. Daniel interprets this one too, and then the king goes crazy for a little while, and he gets humbled by God and learns that all authority only comes from the Lord. Chapter 5, we'll see King Belshazzar, that's Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, interesting story there. He starts praising idols at a party while everybody is drinking wine out of the goblets that Nebuchadnezzar had looted from the temple in Jerusalem. Handwriting appears on the wall, Daniel gets brought in to interpret that, and spoiler alert, Belshazzar uh, dies that very night. And then chapter 6 comes along, and it's probably the most famous one in the book of Daniel, and that's, of course, 
uh, Daniel in the lion's den. The Medes had taken over, we've got King Darius, and then Daniel gets tossed in the lion's den after refusing to obey in order to stop praying to God. So that's the first six chapters of Daniel. We'll try to do one a week. We'll see how that goes. But then the second set of six, not going to dive as much into that this morning, an overview, it's mostly visions about the future, some really, really fascinating and very deep stuff. And we've talked about it before on Sunday mornings, but we'll work through it point by point. So just thinking about the book overall, Daniel, I think if we're just looking at the first six chapters, which is sort of the overview of his life in captivity, we see this span of Daniel's life, and it starts out with him entering into captivity, and he's pretty young when this happens. And then chapter 6, we've got this thing with King Darius. This happens close to the end of Daniel's life. And so we can see here that Daniel spends almost his entire life in captivity. And as we read through these stories, you can see that the things around him while he's in captivity, these things change. There's changes in his life. We have three different kings that are accounted for in these stories. There are two different empires that rise uh, or fall uh, as, as these stories play out. So Daniel's in this world that is changing all around him. He's in hostile territory the whole time. The kings change, the rules change, but in the midst of all of this change, God does not change. And Daniel survives. Daniel even thrives in all of this. So I think this is an especially good study that we're going to work through. Uh, There's some well-known stories in the first six chapters. In the second six, we've got prophecy and end-time stuff, and everybody likes that. But the reason why we wanted to work through this is because I think these passages are quite relevant to us today, if we think about that overall story. Our country, despite what everybody goes to great pains today to uh, go against, our country was founded as a Christian nation. You need only look at the writings of our founding fathers to know that is true. But over time, things have changed. Our kings have changed. And we Christians find ourselves essentially exiled within the borders of our own country. And these new kings have brought new gods And now the official gods of the land are environmentalism, statism, climatism, and others. And we find ourselves kind of like Daniel in this hostile land where the kings have changed and they continue to change and the rules continue to change. But for us, as it was with Daniel, God does not change. And if we remain faithful to God during these times, I think we too will survive as a people and we can even thrive. That's going to be the overarching theme that we look at as we work through this book. All right, so let's just dive straight into the text here. Daniel chapter 1, and we'll start here with verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. So we already worked through the timeline on this just a minute ago, so we're not going to cover that again. Uh, But there is something pretty interesting going on in verse 2 here. We just read Nebuchadnezzar looted articles from the temple. And as we kind of alluded to in our timeline discussion, this is going to become significant later in chapter 5. We're going to see those articles again. But I think it's also demonstrative to us here about what the Babylonians were thinking at the time. Because think about what they did. They took treasures from the first temple, the real temple, the one that Solomon had made. They took them out of there, and then they put them in their own pagan temple. And from their own perspective, this was a demonstration of their mistaken proof of the superiority of their gods. All right, they thought, because we were able to do this, our gods must be more powerful than the God of Israel. But the truth is, as we just read in the first two verses here, God was not inferior. That's not why they were able to do this. God was just using the Babylonians to discipline Israel. All right, so that's... They took the 
the articles from the temple and put them in their own pagan temple. I think this is also pretty fascinating too, because for a long time, this is a very contentious passage. You've got kind of the rise of liberalism within Christianity uh, uh, two or 300 years ago, and then everybody started being very critical of the Bible and saying, oh, there's this contradiction or this problem or that problem. And this is one of the passages that would get held up and they would say, well, you know, no king ever took this. They never would take the idols out of one temple and put it in there. Has that never happened? People don't work like that. And they had their reasons why. And so that was a big thing that people like to bring up until not too long ago, some archaeologists discovered some records outside of the Bible that uh, alluded to this actually taking place. So once again, the arguments of the world sort of fall apart, but it's interesting anyway. If you're ever reading something really old, you might see this held up as being challenged, and we know this is actually true. All right, verses 3 through 5. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from, roy from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Probably guys like Kevin. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. So verse 3, we see this guy Ashpenaz. He's a chief court official, and maybe, maybe he was a eunuch. This is something that gets talked about a lot, and theological points are made based on whether he was a eunuch or not. We don't know, I don't think. Uh, more importantly, though, we see that Nebuchadnezzar had taken hostages. And today, when we see hostages, it's always some sort of terrorist or criminal organization will kidnap someone and demand money uh, under great threat of bodily harm, right? But for most of the world's history, you also at least had another type of hostages. And usually when one kingdom would impose their will upon another, they would take members of the royal family, usually the royal's children, some very important children of the empire, and bring them back to their house. And they'd be treated quite well, and they would be educated and raised and, you know, and, and, and be a part of uh, the, the family of the other place. But it was all sort of under this grave threat of, well, if you don't make good on these things that we promised, accidents happen, I would hate for something to happen to your children. So this was sort of a, a normal way that, that things worked back then with nobility. And so Nebuchadnezzar had taken some of these hostages or, uh, from uh, Jerusalem. And it's also possible that he was training them with the idea that if he did have to go back and subjugate Jerusalem, which he wound up having to do, that those might be good guys to put into power if he needed to go back. And, and that's not what uh, happened, at least not the guys that we read about here in Daniel. But that might have been part of his motivation. So they took the hostages and apparently they treated them rather well. Excuse me, even though there was an agenda. Verse 4 talks about them being educated. The lessons these guys would have received probably included the study of agriculture, architecture, astrology, astronomy, law, mathematics, and the Akkadian language, which apparently was very difficult. And that must be horribly difficult because Hebrew is like ridiculously hard. And so we just say, oh, the Akkadian language, that's hard. This must be really, really difficult. Uh, but if you think about this, this Babylonian approach, taking these hostages and doing this thing, this is a far cry from the Assyrian approach, right? The Assyrians came in and they just butchered everybody to assimilate them. And let's not make a mistake here. The order was given for them to assimilate and it had to be just that. It was an order. So it was a situation... Uh, of the proverbial iron fist in a velvet glove, right? Come over here, get this great education, we'll give you food and wine from the king's table. Sounds great, but it's still an offer that they can't refuse. This is a far cry from the savagery of the Assyrian Empire, but I think, I think it might just be a little bit more insidious. The Assyrians, they'd martyr you at the drop of a hat, but the Babylonians are taking these future leaders and essentially brainwashing them, cleansing them of their former culture, 
one where they knew the true God, and they're replacing that with paganism. And it's all very tempting, right? I mean, the option is keep your old ways and be killed or live this lavish life in the king's service. And so this would have been a very dangerous path to walk for these hostages who found themselves torn away from their families and in this new place. Verses 6 and 7. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names, to Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. So now we see in these verses there's some name changing going on here. And I think we don't want to gloss over this. Our enemy is always changing the names of things. And this is by design, right? Names get changed to corrupt. Names get, of things get changed to transform. In verse 6, it talks about of those who were chosen, of those who got carried away like this. There's no number of those chosen given. We don't know how many hostages were taken. But these four get mentioned specifically become the, because they become important in our story later, right? In verse 6, we get their names. And the names of the, the Hebrew names of these four guys probably tells us a lot about how they were raised we can tell that to, um, these are probably serious men of God. We can tell that because of the faith they demonstrated later, obviously. But it also starts out with their names. In Hebrew, the suffix El means God, and Aya, it's an abbreviation for Yahweh. So if we go through the Hebrew names here, we can see that the parents had this tremendous faith in God that they were using when they named their children. Daniel, it's Dan Ael, right? Again, that is... Um, El means God, right? So Daniel means God is judged or God is my judge. Hananiah, again, he's got Aya at the end, the abbreviation for Yahweh. His name means Yahweh has been gracious. Same suffixes with the next one, Mishael, who is what God is. And Azariah, Yahweh has helped. So again, probably, probably this means these boys were raised in a very serious God-honoring household for their parents to name them these things. And then they wind up getting new names, right? We saw Daniel becomes Belteshazzar, and that means lady protect the king. Hananiah becomes Shadrach, which means I am fearful of a God, and that's God with a lowercase g, talking about a God other than the God of Israel. Mishael becomes Meshach, I am despised, contemptible, humbled before my God. And again, my God, not the God of Israel, but one of these pagan gods in this new culture they're in. And then Azariah becomes Abednego, servant of Nebo, who is a Babylonian god. And I think Nebuchadnezzar's dad was also named after this guy. Um, we'll talk about that more midweek, though. Need some more research on that. So... We can see here with this renaming, it's not just, a, okay, these are your new names because they sound more like our names thing. I think this is brainwashing of, done by the Babylonians, and we see through this renaming that this is so thoroughly scripted that they changed the names of the captives from God-honoring names to names that honored pagan gods. They were trying to completely erase the Jewish cultural influence that these young men came up in. That's what the enemy did thousands of years ago. And of course, today we know it's the very same enemy we're up against. And they do the very same thing, renaming things to pull our culture away from God and toward paganism. You see that renaming all kinds of things. And even uh, people's names today, it's very common when people have children to just make up names. Uh, it used to be it was much more common to name we name our children after great figures of American history. We tried to name three of our boys after uh, famous generals in American history that I admired. It turned out we could only do that with two, but that's okay. It's very common in our culture to name children after Bible characters. All right, we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Merv. Um, <laughs> but, but that stuff doesn't happen much anymore, right? Uh, now people make up names or, 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 you know, they get named after different things. Um, my kids found a funny list of actual names, people, and their favorite one was somebody named their kid number 16, Bus Shelter or something like that. Um, we, we've, we've drawn our attention away from the historical culture, biblically rooted culture of our country, and we're 
looking at something else today. And we'll talk more about this tactic uh, in the midweek, but we know renaming things is going on all around us. Verses 8 through 10. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my Lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would have my head because of you. So Daniel doesn't want to eat this wonderful food from the king's table. And the problem is the food we see in verse 8, that we see talked about in verse 8, wasn't kosher. Almost certainly the meat that would have been involved here would have been sacrificed to pagan gods. And so obviously that would be unclean for any Jewish person to consume. The wine was also probably problematic. That's a little dif more difficult thing to nail down. That'll be a midweek discussion. Uh, but we see here that Daniel is very clearly not subscribing to the win in Rome philosophy. Daniel is faced with a dilemma the government, at the tip of the spear, really, was ordering him to do something that God had prohibited him from doing. And so what does Daniel do? Daniel resisted, but Daniel did this very, very diplomatically. Daniel first asked permission to be exempt from the bad law, right? He does this very quietly, very diplomatically, but this is not a cowardly action at all. This would have taken guts. I had to go to this official and say, hey, yeah, I'm not really wanting to eat this stuff. Can I just have this other stuff instead? He's not in a position of power here, right? He's one of some much larger number of hostages. We don't know how many. His family back home doesn't have any influence here. Um, it's not an exchange student situation. He's a hostage. The whole purpose of him being there is for them to assimilate him. And so if Daniel resists that, then there's no more purpose for Daniel and the Babylonian Empire, is there? But we see Daniel does the right thing. He asks to be exempt. And we see that God doesn't leave him hanging out to dry. In verse 9, God causes this official to show favor to Daniel and to show compassion to Daniel. Now, the official doesn't agree to Daniel's re request, but he also doesn't attack Daniel either because God had softened the man's heart. Daniel asks to be exempt from this thing, but he is denied. But Daniel does not then give up and relent. Verses 11 through 14. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. So verse 11, it looks like uh, despite uh, God causing the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, the official didn't honor Daniel's request. The official still says no. So Daniel goes to one of the, one of the guards. And again, this is maybe an even gutsier maneuver, right? Because you already went to the official and said, hey, man, can I do this thing instead? And the official said, no, you can't do that. And so then he goes to a guy who works for that official and makes the same request. I mean, this is a risk, right? What if that guard had gone to the official and said, you know what Daniel just asked me? I mean, Daniel would have probably been in an enormous amount of trouble if that's the case. And so he makes this request, though, to the guard to eat nothing but vegetables. And understand, this is not a biblical argument for vegetarianism. It's not. And in fact, if people try to use it that way, it's kind of counter to what's going on. Uh, because the whole point is, if you're eating just vegetables, these guys are concerned, well, the person's going to waste away. It takes a miracle of God to make a vegetarian diet cause someone to thrive. That's the premise of this story, all right? So not an argument for vegetarianism here. But interestingly enough, uh, in the, the Hebrew here, um, the word vegetables, it really just means sown things. And so it's entirely possible that and he makes this request to eat nothing but vegetables. That includes grain. There could be some rice or quinoa or whatever they ate back then. It's possible. Um, but regardless, um, 
There's not this meat sacrifice to idols. In the law, there is no prohibition I am aware of against eating sown things. There's no prohibition about that. The dietary law is mostly concerned clean and unclean animals. You can eat whatever plants that you want to. And so what this left him with was any number of vegetables, probably some grain, maybe a bunch of zucchini like we eat at our house, but not the meat that is um, from these animals that would have been sacrificed to a pagan god. And then he says... To the guard, the guard's like pushing back on They said, well, look, just test us for 10 days. All right, and this is a good test because 10 days would have been long enough to prove his point, but not long enough to do any damage. If they were looking bad after 10 days, the guard, in the guard's mind, he'd say, well, they can go back to eating the regular food and they would recover. And in verse 14, we see that the guard agrees because, well, why not? And uh, the Lord was probably working on the man's heart uh, as well. Verses 15 through 17, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. So verses 15 and 16, we see the plan worked. So not only did the plan work, but it worked really, really well. Uh, they were doing better than if they had been eating the other stuff. And so the guard just kind of made it official. In verse 17, it talks about God increasing their knowledge and understanding. God gave them, God gave them information and the ability to discern and apply things in this very wide range of topics that we discussed earlier. And so these guys, they really became true Renaissance men. They were brilliant on a very, very wide range of topics. And there might have been some people in the land who would have been bigger experts in one particular category, but few, if anyone, could have been so well-rounded. And so you've got that that these guys have now been equipped for. Plus, it says that Daniel was given this extra ability, extra ability to understand visions and dreams of all kinds. And so you can imagine the king is trying to turn these guys into advisors, and we can imagine just how good of an advisor these type uh, men equipped like this would be. And so this has been God's plan really all through chapter one, and it sets up uh, Daniel and the other guys for the next chapters in the rest of the book. The Babylonians were training Daniel in these subjects, but the Bible is very clear. It was God who gave them the knowledge and understanding. And in a minute here, we're going to see that this proves to be the thing that makes all the difference in the world. Verses 18 through 20. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. So the king tested these guys, and it appears that God's preparation for the tests was more than adequate. They passed the test with flying colors. And the text said that the king found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his kingdom. And this term 10 times, that's just a Hebrew idiom for many times, right? It wasn't supposed to be a quantitative thing. It was just, these guys are a whole other 10 times better than anybody else. And he talks about their magicians and enchanters in verse 20. Well, Talk more about that in the midweek, but these, uh, there were these guys and other similar types of advisors that Nebuchadnezzar was uh, relying on and the difference between a magician and an enchanter. I don't think it really matters. It's probably some overlap between these jobs. Elsewhere in Daniel, he just refers to this group of men as just the king's wise men. But I think what's important here isn't so much this job versus that job. I think the important thing is the contrast between the worldly advisors and this small group of advisors that God had prepared. And the king found that the men prepared by God were 10 times as useful. Verse 21, and Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. So here we kind of round out that whole timeline where we started with, and we can see chapter one covers 
a huge period of time, most of Daniel's life. And subsequent chapters are going to jump back uh, at other points in his life, and we'll work through some of those stories here. So let's wrap up with just a couple of reflections. One, we note, through, we note here that Daniel resisted sin quietly. Daniel's focus here was just on God. Daniel's focus was not on the spectacle of his relationship with God. This is very different than what people often do today. Notice what Daniel did not do when the government had told him, you have to do this thing that he felt was morally wrong or, or that he knows God told him not to do. Daniel did not riot and burn down City Hall. Daniel did not demand that we defund the police and then start a crime wave right after that to sow chaos and disorder in the community. Daniel didn't send a letter with anthrax to Nebuchadnezzar. He didn't take pot shots from a rooftop at him either. His resistance was not about putting on a show for everyone else. Daniel simply resolved to obey God, and he quietly made that work for himself. And look at the testimony that came out of that. Right? Instead of just making this spectacle that was offensive to everybody around him, that wouldn't turn anybody towards his uh, way of thinking. He has this incredible testimony, the way God equips him when he honors God. God equips him to such a degree when he does the right thing that the king himself winds up saying that Daniel became a man that was 10 times the value of other men that he would turn to for advice. Daniel resisted sin quietly. He did not make it all about the spectacle to others of him resisting what he thought was wrong. We need to take that to heart when we are confronted with the same situation. Next, we see from this, God will take care of you when you do the right thing. Listen, sometimes we get faced with these same situations that Daniel is in. And when that happens, we can feel so alone. We're off in this morally distant land. It's not what we came up with. We're not in the culture anymore. We're surrounded by people who are screaming pagans or whatnot. And they say, this is the law. You have to do this thing. And we know it's wrong. But when that happens, you can feel alone, but you're not alone. Daniel was not alone in all of this. And in fact, and we don't know what the limitations of Daniel's faith were, but we saw God soften the heart of that official. Daniel might have been near his breaking point, and God kept it uh, a workable situation for Daniel. We don't know. But 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30 says, Those who honor me, I will honor. Daniel was in this situation where he had to choose possibly between life and death just over eating a steak that was probably really, really tasty. Daniel did the right thing. Daniel honored God, and God honored him. True to his word in 1 Samuel 2.30, Daniel is able to survive and then even thrive under three different kings, two different empires in this incredibly hostile environment. It's a promise for us too. Look, though, sometimes... When we honor God in this situation, he's going to allow us to be persecuted for an even greater honor. That's absolutely possible. That's absolutely possible. But other times, our situation could wind up looking a lot like Daniel here. We're faced with a tough choice. Follow in order to sin or remain faithful to God at a potentially great cost. But God didn't leave Daniel hanging. He's not going to leave us hanging either. And there's a wonderful, wonderful story that came out of Daniel doing the right thing that even now, thousands of years later, has inspired every single generation around the world to follow suit and do the right thing. We're going to go ahead and put a pen in it here, Lord willing, next week. We can meet together and we'll start working through chapter two. Would you bow with me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Lord, we thank you again so much for letting us be here to worship you with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for giving us uh, this church, this church family. We thank you for preserving in your word this incredible story of Daniel uh, and these other uh, gentlemen who were in captivity and chose to honor you, and you honored that tremendously. Lord, we just pray that throughout this whole study, you will put on our hearts these lessons that we should learn that can make us more powerful people of faith to serve you better, to be able to emulate some of these things, Lord, so we can be better sons and daughters to you as a result. 
We love you so much, God. We ask you, please get us home safely today and bring us back together soon so we can do this again. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.